just one quick warning. Uh, my f- girlfriend fiance has guests over at the moment, her nephews. So if there's if there's sound of small children in the background occasionally, mm-hmm. uh, that'll be that. But hopefully, I'm I'm in an isolated room, but they may they may creep into the background noise. So yeah. That's all it, good. It's okay. Whenever yeah. whenever we have you on the podcast, there's always the sound of small children in the foreground. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god, oh, I'm so, like that was so good, and I'm so glad that you said it, not Luke, so Luke couldn't be smart. <laughs> no, I'm fucking devastated that it wasn't after we started the show. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> Save your material for the right moment. Jesus. <laughs> This episode of the Party Loaded Podcast is proudly sponsored by Audible.com. Check out their awesome catalogue of audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from. And be sure to grab a free audiobook on us and support the show by visiting audibletrial.com slash endgame. Let's party. Everybody, it is party loaded time. Welcome to the podcast. We're here to chat about everything great in the world of video games on this Wednesday evening, the 14th of August. Holy shit, it's the middle of August, but we have joining me, Luke Retallick, tonight. We have Mr. Matt, the Game Dad Diet. Welcome, welcome. Welcome back, Matt. Hello, gamers. Hello. Well, you don't know that everybody's listening is a gamer. We could have some some muggles on here as well. I don't know. What do we call them? Wait. We- I don't know why you would be listening if you weren't a gamer. Of course, of course. But Maybe someone who really absolutely. likes the sound of our voice. Well, yeah, okay, sure. Who, who, Sorry to- who else likes the sound of uh, your voice, Mr. Christian Paulson Brown? Welcome. Me, because I cut in before my introduction. <laughs> That's entirely fair. Oh, uh, holy shit. Well, welcome. Um, Matt, you're back. You, you, you took a week off. You I am here. had learning, teachy stuff to do, and uh, I think that's a noble enough cause that we can't give you too much rubbish. So uh, we actually completely missed our opportunity to throw mad shade at you last week, so that's kind of our bad. Yeah. Why were you going to throw mad shade at me? I mean, like- I don't know. It's really? almost like an unwritten rule that's kind of- de- Oh, maybe it's just Adrian. No, I think it's just Adrian. <laughs> it's just yeah. Adrian. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you have plenty of reason to throw mad shade at me, so that's fine. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So what, what's what's going on? What, do you, what have you been up to the last uh, week or so, sort of generally speaking with- uh, So um, the, the reason I actually wasn't on the podcast is because I was doing a talk, um, which wasn't just for game students, it was actually for local industry as well, mm-hmm. um, where we were talking about failure and embracing it. And basically just uh, this whole idea that if you make a mistake while developing a game, you know, you should own that mistake because if you fail to do so, it's going to cause you problems later on. Yeah. And I want to just mention it really quickly because I was really proud of the framing that we used for um, kind of describing all this stuff to people. And so it was myself and Brendan Reagan, who I used to work with at um, Stirfire. He's currently working at Titanium on a big triple AIP that I can't talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were basically chatting um, and, and, and so we opened up at the talk talking about Mass Effect Andromeda and everything that went wrong with that game and why it went wrong. Mm. And they were talking about our personal experiences um, with failure in the industry and um, how we would kind of change our behavior to to improve on that if we were to go back and, and do it all again. Yeah. And, you know, basically basically this whole message about, hey, like we have we you have to own your mistakes in order to improve upon them, because if you don't own them, then you'll just do something worse later on. And then we ended the talk with Anthem. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, which, which got the point across very, very well, um, I think, to everybody in the audience. But it was good. It was a really positive thing. The weekend before that talk, I was actually also busy because I was part of the Game Makers Toolkit Game Jam. Oh, very cool. Yep. So is that uh, the main Game Jam this year, just with that thing, no. or is it a separate thing? No, so the Game Makers Toolkit um, is actually a YouTube channel um, where they cover a whole bunch of really interesting stuff um, about game development. And you would actually really enjoy this, Christian, because I know you uh, you watch New Frame Plus. Um, oh, yeah. Game Love Makers it. Toolkit d- dives into that stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so so their their game jam, like it's just it's just a, a smaller game jam in comparison to the global game jam, which is usually earlier in the year around Australia Day. Mm. And so Game Makers Toolkit Jam... Um, their theme this year was uh, there can be only one. And so 
uh, uh, the whole reason I did it was because a whole bunch of my students wanted me to do it with them. And then I had a whole bunch of stuff come up and I ended up stuck at home, but I still participated in the jam. And so I made a game where you play as a centaur that wears 3D glasses, <laughs> um, which actually worked amazingly well. I might add. I'm trying to. But, th- so I'm trying th- to draw that into the theme. Yes. Well, there can be only one eye. Okay. You say Cyclops. Centaur. Cyclops. That yes. makes more sense. Okay. Yes. Cyclops wearing 3D glasses. You only have one eye. Oh, well, sure. yes. I was so, getting like an image of like a space centaur, and I was thinking Alpha Centauri <laughs> or something like that. Uh, no, no, Cyclops. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, you, you're playing a Cyclops and you're wearing these 3D glasses, but you can only look through one lens at a time. So you keep on having to swap lenses. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Like, like the old um, the magic eye things that you have the crank on yeah. the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so basically when you have the red lens over your eye, the whole world turns red. And when you have the blue lens over your eye, the whole world turns blue. Mm-hmm. And this basically turns it into a puzzle game where certain uh, elements in the environment will be hidden away if you're wearing the red lens and that object is actually cyan or blue in color, mm-hmm. it will turn black. Um, and so it just kind of disappe- disappears into other black objects. Um, and so you have to keep on swapping the lens back and forth to be able to actually see the environment. And it actually worked really well um, for a 48 hour game jam where I only spent 12 hours of it making something. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was rather proud of it that. sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was, uh, people have uh, really enjoyed it. So that's neat. Mm. Um, but in terms of actual gaming, all right, because I did play some games. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, let's let, let's jump into to this week in gaming. What do you got for us, buddy? Yeah. So I'm gonna very briefly mention this super cute little game that I picked up. Um, that's like an experimental game. Um, called a short hike. Mm-hmm. And I I grabbed it just because like wow the screenshots look super cute, and it is super cute. Like imagine if Animal Crossing were a platformer. And that's a short hike. Oh, okay. And it's really, really good. Like, it might be one of my favorite indie games of this year, actually. Like, really chill, super nice story. It has a really cute moral at the end, and it surprises you in terms of, like, character development. Mm-hmm. Um, you make a lot of assumptions about the the character that you're playing in the game, and then at the end, it kind of reveals, like, they're a bit deeper than you gave them credit for. It's a really nice feeling. It's just, yeah, it's it's super cute. I really enjoyed it. Um, Was it so a you should go PC buy it. game or PC? Yep. Um, so you can get it on itch and Steam. I bought it on Steam. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like ten bucks or something like that, really cheap. But other than that, uh, a bit more of a substantial narrative game. I started and finished Detroit Become Human over the span of like four days. Oh, okay. I'm very curious <laughs> to see where you, where you ended up with that one. So, um, well, nobody's dead. Put it that way. Really, nobody. <laughs> yep. Holy yep, shit. I, I played it on the high difficulty and I managed to get um, everybody out alive. As far as main characters go, the main three, mm. they're all alive. So that, that um, means that you missed out on a magical combine harvester accident scene. So have you, did you heard about that? <laughs> uh, no, I hadn't. Okay, cool, cool. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I was really, really happy with that ending. Um I really love Kara and um, Connor. I thought they were fantastic characters. Yeah. Marcus felt a little bit dry to me. Agree. Um, in terms of being like a character, I didn't really enjoy him that much. But I, I thought that his narrative was super fascinating. Mm. Um, like, the, outside of the characters, like, narratively, the game has flaws, in my opinion. Um, and this is, this is nitpicky, right? Because I- th- thoroughly enjoyed this game and I actually kind of regret not playing it sooner um but it feels like heavy-handed and it felt like it got a bit repetitive especially in Kara's storyline mm. like I uh, if you've played it and you've seen Kara's story and you didn't like kill her at the start of the game or something then you probably know what I'm talking about in that things kind of repeat themselves and it, it feels like it's really trying to hammer home this moral about her narrative in particular mm. um, and the way that people treat her. So for anyone who's um, unaware, like her major arc is that she's like a, a servant um, android yeah. and, uh, you know, ends up ha- having to escape with a, a young um, child. So yeah, it, it, she's on the run for most of the game, essentially. Yeah. 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 Mm. Um, and she, she basically ends out relying on people that she shouldn't be relying upon. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so that, that was the, her story in particular kind of, um, I wasn't a huge fan of, but oh my God, Connor, holy fuck. Mm. 
His story is so fucking wholesome and so much fun. And as a character, he's just great. And like every single time he delivered a line, I'm like, okay, calm down, Keanu. Like he just sounded so much like Keanu Reeves so often. Mm. Um, and I loved it, right? Like it, it was just really good. Cause that like that kind of robotic delivery makes total sense for an Android. Yeah. Um, but his whole narrative, like I, I found myself and the way they do this in the game is brilliant. But like at the very start, right? Like you're you're told what your purpose is and you're trying to fulfill your purpose to the best of your ability. And then as you're playing the game, you're learning more and you're changing your behaviors and it feels really organic. Yeah. Um, and that's just it's it's a really amazing thing, the way in which they influence you to kind of just do that. Um and I mean you, you can totally stay with the way that you start the game off, but as you're kind of learning more as, as Connor and everything, it just feels organic that you know, he would, he would change his opinion. Mm. Um, and the way they kind of play that off all the way towards the end of the game is just brilliant. Like, I love it. That, that character is a ton of fun. Um, I enjoyed it enough that I kind of want to go back just to see what happens if I played it differently. And if I didn't try to make sure everybody was okay, because yeah. Probably my other favorite thing, it, it, it's this whole idea, like, Detroit Become Human is like playing a chess game against yourself, mm. right? And, like, you can totally plan things out to try and get the best outcome, or you can try and defeat yourself. And that seems really interesting to me, to actually go back and see how much I could actually dick myself over. Um, so I might actually have to replay it just to do that. But yeah, I- thoroughly enjoy it I just, if you haven't played detroit become human you should totally should it's a really good game yeah one of the things i don't know if you're aware of and I, i'm i'm reasonably confident that this is correct um from from my understanding having played through and, and reading about uh, different branching narrative paths i'm pretty sure that connor is the character that you have the most opportunities to die with so throughout yes. the entire game yeah yeah that's definitely yeah. right mm, yeah so did, um, did your connor not die uh, at all and you didn't have to like sort of he, go back he never died at all he wow. never died at all Nope. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> mine, mine died like, like three or four fucking times. <laughs> really? Yeah. That, I, I'm, I'm honestly surprised. Like there are a couple of occasions where I came close. Like there's one occasion where you're chasing somebody across a freeway with very fast moving cars. Mm. And it felt like the quick time events for the person you're playing as that Connor's chasing were not quite as severe as the ones that Connor was getting, yep. but he came out of it alive. So, like, he didn't die there. Oh, and dude, there's a couple dude, of I other lost, occasions. I lost Connor in the opening act with the hostage negotiation on the oh, rooftop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right. um, yeah. Do, yeah. Do we, how, how carefully do we have to dance around spoilers for this game? Because it's, uh, it's a year old. It right? is pretty we, old now. Well, can we, we, I, I don't consider it to be a spoiler, given that most people who play this game will not necessarily make the same choice as we do. So they'll probably yeah. get a different experience anyyway. So, well, well yeah. t- tune out if you're really, really sensitive to Detroit spoilers for like a minute. Mm. Um, but. I just want to say, because like with Connor, the thing that's interesting about him is how he's the only of the three who who can die, but then is is replaced. Like yeah, and, and like if the other two characters die, they they're gone for good. Mm. But with but with Connor, he, he keeps coming back, uh, and I think that that's that like factors into why his story is like what's so interesting for me is is yeah. that, that idea of like continuity of self and like what it means to be an individual being and and that yep. sort of thing. So yeah. I'm surprised that yeah, your Connor didn't die at all. Put it this way, mm. the, the context of me never having my Connor die meant that at the end of the game, after the series of decisions I made, when a second Connor turned up, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I was th- just thinking that. Like, you, you probably actually dicked yourself in a way by missing out on like a part of the story that actually kind of matters yeah, by not dying. A little bit, so. yeah. Yeah. But, but at the same time, like it made this plot twist at the end that there are other Connors. Mm. Mm really really neat you know yeah and they know the exact same things that my connor knows and i didn't realize that this was a thing yeah like yeah. i thought that if i lost connor that would be it and and connor's story would just not continue mm. um so uh, that that plot twist at the end definitely hit me pretty hard and i seriously enjoyed it yeah it also it also made like we're still in spoiler territory here but yeah. it also made that interaction with the um 
with the detective at the very Clancy end. Clancy Brown? With Hank, yeah. yeah. That, that's the other best yeah. reason to play Connor, because Hank- Clancy Brown's yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like, that interaction at the very end, um, so, so my Connor ended out in the android facility, right? Yeah. Um, and the other Connor ended out getting Hank and, like, holding a gun to his head. And there's this whole moment where Hank has to- pick which Connor is the real one. Mm. Um, and that moment became all the more satisfying because my Connor had never died because it had been the same one from start to finish, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh God. It, there's so much cool stuff in that game. It's just unfortunate that there is a couple of those narrative beats that could have been done way better. Yeah. yeah I, I personally think that the Connor, I'd say is in my, in my, in my opinion, the only good of the uh, story of the three. Like, I don't like Marcus Orcara's stories at all. I, in fact, I I almost hate them. Like, I feel like the the science fiction like concepts that they grapple with are handled very clumsily, and I think that yeah. they are they are like concepts that were played out in like sixties and seventies sci fi. Like, it's like super kind of old trite sci fi concepts about like yeah. you know em- like emancipation of androids and having empathy for, for, you know, inorganic beings, that sort of thing. I entirely agree. Yeah. But like I, Connor I, was fantastic. I, I really like Kara as a character, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but her story, like, that, her, her opening chapter is really good and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but then they basically repeat it mm-hmm. and it doesn't feel great, right? It's like, oh, for God's sake, we, we're here again, you know? Yeah. Um, And Marcus is, oh, God, like- Playing playing through as Marcus and choosing to be a pacifist sucked mm, because yeah. over and over again, the game gives you reasons to not be a pacifist. But it's like, I know, I know this is a fucking trap, right? And if I choose not to be a pacifist, this is going to go horrendously badly. And it felt like all the way through, it's, it's tempting fate, right? Like, how far am I willing to go being a pacifist before they just kill Marcus off and he, he becomes- this character that sacrifices himself for the greater good, you yeah. know? And I was kind of expecting that. Thank God it didn't happen. Mm. But like, yeah, it, it didn't feel good on the way there though. And it my, just my having biggest to make issue with, decisions again. My well, biggest issue with Marcus in the same vein is that he's the one character out of the three that um, he, his story is so rapidly progressing that a lot of his character development feels unearned. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really wish- like, and this is going to spoiler territory <laughs> again, but like when when the old man gets killed off mm. and, you know, he shows that emotion, you know, um, to just kill Marcus off moments later doesn't give him a chance to grapple with that. Mm. And that's a missed opportunity, you know, like he just finally had this moment where he was attached to a human being, but then he's been killed and- it's never really like resolved this emotion, mm, mm. Um, and that just yeah, it, it feels like a missed opportunity. It's like okay, we've got to we've got to progress Marcus's story really quick. So let's just shoot him so we can get him into this junk heap. You know, it's the equivalent of like fridging a character, right? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Outside of all that, I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it is definitely a mixed experience, but I think it's worth replaying for sure. It's yeah. it's worth replaying just for fucking Connor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to replay it on stream, I'd be happy to hang and chat with you as we go through. That that would be a really fun time, I think. I, I may just do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. get him killed at every opportunity. And he, yeah. he, 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 the more he comes back, the more he, he like, breaks down. Like, his yeah. systems start to, like, haywire, and it's, it is amazing. Don't worry, Matt. I, I, I can point to- out all the good times to do that. Don't worry. <laughs> I want to replay it just to play evil Connor uh, and yeah. never never die, but be evil. Yeah, <laughs> Blade Runner Connor. <laughs> yes, I was thinking more John Connor. Uh, <laughs> John Connor. Yeah, because he's a freaking Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, uh, Christian, what what are yeah. you been up to? You, you, how many more hours have you sunk into the the Fire Emblem? Not as not as many as Adrian has. Um, he he texted me last night that he's actually finished his playthrough of, of Fire Emblem. I'm oh, like, wow. Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he. he I, I picked it up on release, and he quite quickly eclipsed me, and has has now finished. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how many hours he put into it in the end, but I'm like 35 hours in or, or maybe close to 40. And well, I think what, whatever half- it is, you can add 10 on compared to you anyway. So yeah, maybe yeah. his false start. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He even got the false start and he's already finished it. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm about, I'm just over halfway because the game's kind of neatly divided into, into two distinct halves. Um, and I, I've just started the second half. Um, 
And I just main, main thing I wanted to say as far as updates go is that I'm actually quite disappointed with the combat in the game after getting further into it because it's way, way, way too easy. Mm. Like I, I'm playing mm-hmm. on the normal difficulty with classic mode, so with permadeath. Um, I, I could have put it on hard, but but I didn't and I can't now change it. And on normal, the fights are just ridiculously easy. Like it's supposed to be a game of, it's a strategy, you know, strategy RPG. So you should be like carefully positioning your units to bait out enemy units and then, you know, p- put, putting your tank at the front and that sort of thing. But really my units are so strong that I can just hastily run them straight forward and then the enemy units just run into my guys and just die and like i really don't have to use that much strategy at all um and it's quite disappointing Mm. and yeah yeah i've read i've read out some other people saying that it's too easy even even on hard i've heard that it's it's too easy um it's a bit of a shame so that's good to know because i'm actually thinking about picking it up (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you if you haven't played any Fire Emblem game before, then maybe the normal difficulty is okay. Or, but or, have you played many strategy RPGs in general, Matt? Yes, okay, I've played a fair amount. Yeah, yeah. You, you you could probably play it on hard then, because it really that there, there's the the first couple of missions might seem uh, like tricky, but then there's a there's a very sh- like immediate hump that you get over, then it becomes a cakewalk. Um, right. Yeah, and it, even like the bosses. Like there's a th- this is the first Fire Emblem to have monsters in it, and monsters occupy like four four squares, and there's supposed to be like a system in the game where you kind of you attack all four of the squares the monster occupies, and that like stuns it, and then that'll like stop its attack that it's charging. But I've never ever had to think about that system because I just kill the monsters in one turn. Uh, mm. So yeah. like there, I can tell that there's depth, there's more depth to the combat, but I'm not. I'm not being able to interact with it because I'm killing things too easily. Yeah, that makes right. sense. Yeah. Well, um, but other than that, it's 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 good. Like the the story stuff's still really cool, and the, the characters themselves are really cool. So yeah. It's a, did you get a, an idea from Adrian as to how long the game sort of was likely to be, or not from Adrian? But I've read online. I think most people are taking kind of sixty to eighty hours, something like that. Jesus, that's God way damn longer Adrian. Than I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Holy crap! Okay, uh, and he, he even he mentioned the possibility of starting a second playthrough because oh my God. because it is a game where you pick one of three houses. It would be interesting to see it from the other houses' perspectives. Yeah, yeah, um, because that that's something that's really cool about the story is it. I've I've read that I mean, no matter which of the three pit houses you choose, your the re- information that's revealed to you about the main plot is is selective, and it's done in a way that makes you feel like you're in the right, n- no matter who you choose. So. The, yeah, so like it's piece, it's given to you piecemeal and it always makes you feel like you're the good guy and the other houses turn out to be the bad guys, but it's just a matter of perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, most villains like in um, sort of, uh, you know, tales of, of hero- heroism are the heroes of their own story anyway, so that makes total sense to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, cu- I'm curious to see what it's like from, from the other ch- houses' perspective. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got one very, very important question, and this one's for Matt. So, Matt, given what you know is coming out in the next two weeks, when the fuck are you going to find time to play Fire Emblem, my friend? Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, so here's the thing, right? Fire Emblem's on the Switch. Oh, okay. And Here we go. I, I, yeah. Right now, I'm playing uh, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu on the way to and from work. Yeah. Um, and that's great. Uh, I will probably not get Fire Emblem until after I finish that. <laughs> Because that's kind of my travel game at the moment. Mm. But outside of that, I probably wouldn't play a lot of Fire Emblem. And that's a lot of trips to and from work to finish it. <laughs> I was going to say, you just leave an hour <laughs> earlier and just t- take like a circuitous route. To- yeah. <laughs> just go work. back and forth on the train line a couple of times. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. No, that's a good point with the Switch, though. I hadn't actually considered that. Did, uh, Christian, I assume that you've been mostly playing it at home as opposed to on the go like Adrian would have do- been doing more of. Yeah, mostly yeah. at home. Yeah. And oh, quick, quick Switch update for me as well, actually. I probably tomorrow will be embarking on my Android Switch emulation. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll give an update next week as to whether or not I brick my Switch or whether or not I'm playing <laughs> Android games on my Switch now. Nice. That will be a very, very valuable update for anyone mm-hmm. planning on doing the same. Yeah, very cool. Um, well, I don't have much by way of update for me this week because I've been largely playing the same uh, two games that I talked about last week, that being Destiny 2 and... Uh, 
Hearthstone. So we're getting quite a bit of time in with the new Hearthstone expansion, which has been a lot of fun. Um, and I do want to mention that uh, for anyone that was listening along to my Destiny 2 chat last week about the uh, the current event that's on, yes, I fucked up. Yes, it's called the Solstice, not the Dawning. The Dawning's an old one. <laughs> I apologize. I'm a Destiny scrub. There we go. It's out. <laughs> <laughs> but, At least you admit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's the uh, first step to recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to have some help in uh, in another week because uh, Cross Save goes live next week. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So I purchased Shadowkeep on my PC last night. Excellent. Excellent. But uh, I can tell you the other thing I'm really looking forward to. And guess what I'm doing right this moment, gentlemen? What do you think uh, I've got uh, downloading? Uh, is no it Man's creepy? Sky. I have got oh, the I cheated update. and looked on the documents. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my um, download patch for No Man's Sky Beyond is downloading right this moment because I checked the social media before we started recording tonight and it turns out that the PlayStation 4 one has gone live already, even though I thought it was going to be later tonight. So uh, when we are done, I'll see where we're at with that and I may be jumping into some VR No Man's Sky tonight, which I am really excited about. So... Um, yeah, mo- most of my sort of hype in the last couple of days has been directed towards that because uh, Hello sort of uh, posted up. They- they- they've mentioned for a while that the um, the Beyond update is going to have three main tiers to it. We already knew that one of them was um, VR. We already knew that another one was a massively improved multiplayer experience. The third one they'd kept pretty cagey about what it actually was. Um, but it turns out it's just like a-, a wholesale sort of, you know, moving the game up to like a 2.0 version of improvements across the board um so they've added a whole bunch of new features but the one that really caught my attention and got me excited to play it um over the next week is they're adding a whole bunch of automation and um, computing and electronic stuff to their base building so effectively like putting almost the redstone equivalent for minecraft players into no man's sky and that sort of stuff got me super fucking hyped because i love me some redstone when it comes to minecraft and mucking around with all the mechanics of that game so yeah We'll see what sort of weird and wacky stuff people come up with. There's some pretty interesting articles out there that have been dropping recently about uh, some some strange creations of, uh, you know, massive groups of people coming together for build projects and putting stuff out there. So, yeah, it's going to be good. It's gonna I can't be- wait to hop into it. It's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. Very, very cool. So um, I'll leave it at that because that's pretty much next week hype as opposed to what I'm actually playing. But you can be damn sure that we'll have some chat about that next episode. So, yeah. But in the meantime, let's talk some news. Now it's time to hear some gaming news. Time for some gaming news. All right, well, um, I'm going to kick off our news tonight with, uh, I mean, unfortunately, probably one of the biggest stories of the week, which means there hasn't been a huge amount going on, but this one's kind of relevant. So um, you all know who Ninja is, of course. He's, you know, pretty much made his name uh, through all of the, the Fortnite wave of of success over the last sort of six to 12 months. And uh, at um, present, he was the, and I, I say was because of the next bit, he was uh, the largest uh, current streamer on Twitch, most successful. I think he, he has the current record for largest number of concurrent viewers, which I believe was the um, famous stream that he did a while back where uh, Drake joined him and, and he streamed Fortnite, or maybe it's even higher since then because his popularity sort of skyrocketed with that game as it, it sort of got big. Um, but anyway, for people are probably aware by now that uh, there's been a big sort of news thing this week where um, Ninja has actually signed a deal with Microsoft to move over his streaming in its entirety to the Mixer platform. Now, that in itself is like, okay, cool. If you don't give a crap about Ninja and, or you know who he is, what he rep- represents, you don't care about Fortnite, that sort of stuff. Maybe it's news you, that you're not that interested in. But the really interesting thing that spawned as a result of this is twofold. Number one is a lot of people are now looking at Mixer and Twitch together and comparing the two and seeing sort of what one has to offer over the other. And the interesting thing is there's actually quite a few things going in Mixer's favor at the moment that have uh, sort of built quite a bit of interest in that platform where there wasn't before. So what we might be seeing is a little bit of a changing of the guard when it comes to some of the more popular streamers, actually just by default being on Twitch, we might be seeing them um, sort of moving over and taking their audiences with them. You know, the question is, is this the catalyst to see like a bit of a migration? I'm not sort of suggesting that, uh, you know, all of a sudden Twitch is going to lose its market share and we're going to see everybody move over to Mixer because that's 
clearly not going to happen. Um, yeah, no way. Yeah, there's, there's way too much risk involved with people losing their um, their audiences to do that. I, I think only the most popular streamers or the ones that really don't have a lot to lose would be the ones that would benefit more from that at the moment. But, um, I mean, interestingly, I, I've been doing a bit of research on it as well just to sort of get my head around what some of the, the key differences are. And some things that I've learned uh, about Mixer offering that, um, that Twitch doesn't, which I found was quite interesting – one being that there's a really good integration with Xbox One on Mixer. So if you do happen to be the sort of player that's um, playing Xbox games predominantly, which, I mean, there's not, not a lot of them out there, but there's definitely a few. They've got that that sort of seamless um, integration with the Xbox app, as you'd expect, because it's a Microsoft platform. Um, but one of the things that they do um, offer is uh, co-streaming, which means that you can actually have up to four broadcasters simultaneously streaming their gameplay to a single location. Now... That's kind of relevant um, for people like us, you know, for example, yeah. because we've chatted a lot of times about how to actually technically do that. And, uh, you know, aside from some sort of, you know, wizardry involving, you know, sharing of screens through Discord or other, you know, shenanigans to kind of, you know, get like a combined picture going or where we can switch points of view and that sort of thing. It's something that's really hard to do. So the fact that Miss Mixer actually offers that is probably a big point in its favor. But yeah, there's a few other interesting things too. They have uh, a different kind of reward system for people who watch um, content on Mixer. Because on Twitch, they've got, you know, that ecosystem of digital goodies that people can unlock for, you know, getting, um, they can get like emotes and chat badges and that sort of stuff. A lot of that's linked to the spending on the platform, like with supporting channels and becoming subscribers of various different channels. The way Mixer does it is mostly rewarding viewers for just spending time on the platform. So that, that, that's more more prevalent in Twitch now as well. There's is the, it? There's, okay. Twitch drops is a system where oh, true. Yeah, yeah. Just, just from watching a, a certain amount of time, you can get like Hearthstone packs, for example, for the, the big tournaments, that sort of thing. So Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that's usually linked to particular streamers or events, though, isn't it? It's not more. Yes, of, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is more like a widespread kind of um, system that exists across the entire platform. So as you watch streams, you can earn XP, level up, and you receive like the mix of currency, which is called Sparks. Um, so oh, okay. that gets your perks. So you, I, I think that you've actually got a bit of agency over what you can choose to to spend that on as opposed yeah. to it being linked to the individual streamer. So, yeah, I just found the whole huh. thing really fascinating. Like just the fact that now there is actually finally a bit of a mounting um, sort of uh, movement towards having some real competition to Twitch, which, you know, could be a good thing moving forward. And um, the fact that Ninjas sparked this, I think, has, has made for some interesting discussion this week. Um, but the other thing that's come about as a result of this is that um, Twitch actually – I personally think had a major fuck up in the wake of Ninja's move in that they've actually done something that they haven't done with really any other um, streamer that's left the platform until now. Um, and that is that they've actually used his now um, sort of uh, unoccupied channel space to advertise a whole bunch of other streamers on the platform. So they've actually got like a different format landing page for Ninja's channel compared to what would happen if anybody else left the platform. Um, and, you know, on one hand, that's bad because it kind of shows that, you know, they're, they're clearly sort of, you know, treating nin Ninja's, uh, you know, brand and his popularity differently to the, than they would anyone else. And even though it technically might be permissible under, you know, whatever um, terms of service that Twitch has, you have to ask why are they treating him differently to everybody else? And uh, I mean, the obvious answer is because of money and because he's got a huge following and they're trying to, you know, cash in on that essentially. Um, but the other thing that came about as a result of it is that whatever algorithm they're using, clearly they haven't been, uh, you know, enforcing their own um, content curation uh, clearly enough because there was a uh, channel that got through which had pornographic material on it. So there was effectively yep. a channel with um, stuff that didn't meet um, Twitch's terms of service um, getting advertised through the now defunct space of what was their biggest streamer before. So as you can imagine, didn't go down so well. Um, Ninja sort of hopped on social media and sort of pointed it out and pointed out the uh, the inadequacy um, when it came to you know treating um, his brand differently to anybody else who'd been on the platform. The fact that that now impacts his um, uh, sort of name, you know, uh, you know, a stream getting through that that is, uh, you know, quite damaging um, to, to, you know, names that it's linked with. And that that's obviously not a good thing. So, um, you know, Twitch has since come forward and apologized, but it, it's just, it, it's an unforced error. It's a pretty fucking bad thing to let happen, really. And the, it, it's a very bad look. Yeah. 
They, yeah. they have they have reverted his channel to a standard offline channel now. Yeah, the whole the, yeah. So that that whole showing other streamers is 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 done. Is so. done. Yeah, so, but it's probably a good lesson for them to uh, you know maybe stick to their own rules first before trying yeah. you know to cash in on someone else's fame. But uh, yeah, a bit shitty. But uh, again, it's it's been a good um, catalyst for conversation and uh, I guess you know setting of standards. So yeah, yeah. I have I have a couple more thoughts on on this whole thing. Mm. Um, one is that. It's actually been surprisingly beneficial to other Twitch streamers that that Ninja has left, not just because of the the viewers that might be left over that haven't transferred over with him, but also because um, a lot of subscriptions on Twitch come from Twitch Prime, which yeah. is a a recurring sort of uh, bonus subscription you get as part of having an Amazon Prime membership, um, and. Every user with Amazon Prime gets one Twitch Prime and they have to choose one channel to give that to. And Ninja was kind of a, a black hole for, for thousands and thousands of Twitch Prime subscriptions. So now, now there are you know thousands of Twitch users who are having to, to find another channel to, to use their Twitch Prime on. And that's kind of redistributing the wealth to, to a lot <laughs> of other, a lot of other um, Twitch streamers, which is, which is pretty cool. It's a bit of a, a Robin Hood effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of the, the the vault's been busted open, and then everyone, you know, all the other streamers, are just like grabbing what they can. Yeah. Um. And, and the other thing I wanted to quickly mention is Ninja put out like his announcement video when he transferred over to Mixer, and it was just this like fake <laughs> little press conference thing with a with a Red Bull fridge that was asking him, asking him questions, and it was all it's all fun and everything. But I, 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 there's a part of me that it like it really grinds my gears that. The way that he framed it was he he was going on about, you know, he wants to get back to his his roots and like, you know, refocus and try try new things and and like that's all absolute bullshit. It's yeah. it's yeah. Microsoft dumped a giant do- like bag with a dollar sign on his desk and said, We'll give you this much money if you come to Mixer. And he went, Okay, yep. that's a lot of money. Um, it's not at all about, you know, wanting to to get back to his roots or anything like that so yeah 100% yeah. agree i thought that whole video was cringe as hell but yeah I, yeah, yeah yeah so um wild speculation question how much do you think they offered him if you had insane to guess insane amounts i I've, yes. I've heard i've read um other streamers who have been like twitch streamers who have been offered not not even to permanently switch to mixer but to do special events on mixer mm. and there have been streamers that have been offered up to 7 million dollars to do a special stream on Mixer. Holy so imagine moly. imagine the amount of money to get Ninja to go there permanently. It would be insane. It'll, it'll be ongoing cash. Like yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll be paying him to be there. So like it'll be like his cash up front to be on the platform and his cash to make up for the fact that you're not getting those Amazon Prime subscriptions. Mm. Yeah. Be crazy. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, good on him. You can't really fault the guy for you know, making a living doing what he loves. So he, he also published a book this week, or he's just got a book <laughs> that's, that's come out. Um, it's like it's literally Ninja's Guide to Being a, a a Gamer, and it has like how to train yourself to do like headshots and things like that. <laughs> I I love the the Polygon article about it, which basically the review was in the title that basically said if you can read this, then you shouldn't read this. Uh, <laughs> it's basically their it's review. For you. <laughs> if you absorb yeah. content on this site, then you are not the target audience for this book. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. no. If you can read, you shouldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That that's the way it read. So yeah, yeah. I thought that was quite funny. Yeah. Nice. Um, but speaking of money, so um, Screen West, I actually had mentioned them uh, a while ago. So they're basically West Australia's uh, f- uh, screen funding body. Um, they're not a government organization. They're, they're kind of close to government. It's a bit weird. Um, but a while ago I had been talking about the fact that they had launched the game development pilot fund in which they had a hundred thousand dollars, uh, to give away to game developers in Western Australia, uh, creating games. Um, so those game developers would go to screen West with a pitch Mm -hmm. say, Hey, we are making this thing. We want, you know, $15,000, $20,000. Um, so $20,000 is the maximum amount you can request. So they had money for at least five games at $20,000. And I have the inside line. So we're recording this on Wednesday night, but it's going to come out much later than that. Um, Thursday morning, so tomorrow morning, it'll be announced who exactly uh, received the funding. And and, um, and who, how could you possibly know who at least one of these people are, Matt? I have no idea. Uh, 
I I am the chair of Let's Make Games. Clearly, that's that's what the reason is. <laughs> um, no, so the the recipients of the fund. Um, there's some ones in here I am I actually know of, and some some that I actually hadn't heard about. Mm. Um, so you guys might have heard of Lost and Hound, um, ah, yep. which is a little local nope. game. You haven't heard of it, yeah? Nope. So it's it's basically um, a, a game by a local dev, really cool guy. Um, that's all about playing as a dog and helping people um, that uh, I believe it's all about them being blind and you're basically using your ability to go find them and help them. Um, fun, fun, awesome. fact, and- fun fact, we are in that game. There is a billboard oh, yeah. in Lost and Hound with Party Loaded on it. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Mm. Huh. Um, then there's Nicograms. Um, which is a actually surprisingly popular mobile game. So that's gotten some funding. Um, there's a game. So these these next two games I've actually not heard about, but I know the, the developers on them. Um, well, I know of them. Um, so there's Ghost Cam um, and there's Court Fiends. And I don't know the context of either of those games. I basically just know of them. And apparently the judges uh, for the Screen West uh, Games Fund were very, very impressed with them. Um, those games and had basically demanded that they get funded else uh, there was going to be fights. Yeah. So, um, and then the last one that got funded, which is probably the worst of this group. Honestly, I don't know why anybody would care. The dev is um, an absolute douche as well. I- yeah, oh, what an asshole, right? Yeah. Like nobody likes them. Um, well, the, the guy, the guy that submitted the funding, like everybody else, the team is great. Yeah. Um, Talentless yeah, hack, so- I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so so yes uh basically what we're saying is that my game got funded yay, um, well so, yay. so yeah recaptive um which is a game about helping an ai escape the game that it's trapped in um that got funded and i'm super proud of the team i've actually known about this for about like two weeks now and i've had to keep my mouth shut about it yeah it's not um, the reason you were so- absent last week but it kind of worked out well didn't it <laughs> It did, it did actually kind of work out well because, like, every single time we were recording a podcast and I know this, I want to say something. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so I've I've been doing, like, several interviews uh, over the last two days about the, the funding and everything that will actually start coming out as of tomorrow um, once they do the announcements. It won't be tomorrow for you, dear listener. It will be Thursday, West Australia time, if you're over in the United States. But yeah, so um, all these games have gotten funded. It's really good. I'm super happy with the stuff that got funded because it's it's a bunch of games that have either a ton of potential or I am pretty certain are going to get finished. Yeah, so uh, congratulations to everybody that um, got funded, including myself. Pat on the back. Yeah. (laughs) So so I I don't know much about this this funding business. So is this money that you you will be able to use to finish your game? Yes. So it's twenty thousand dollars that we get to spend on wages. Um, okay. So it'll mean that the team gets paid something to actually make this little passion project. Mm-hmm. Um, we've only got a small team, um, but so Screen West, like they throw around very, very substantial sums of money um, for film and such. So a hundred thousand dollar games fund is actually a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Um, like you may have heard of the um, Netflix movie I Am Mother, mm-hmm. um, yep. that actually got Screen West funding oh, and wow. a substantial amount of it. Um, Was that filmed and locally here, or I believe partially? Okay. Um, either either filmed locally, like so. Screen West has some very very strict stuff about how you actually get funded, and most of it is basically like, hey, look, this has to be either primarily done in Western Australia or like. Uh, be to the benefit of Western Australia, right? right? Um, so most of our team, like the reason we got funded, like uh, three out of four of us that are currently on the team are in Western Australia. Um, one of them is actually Damon, um, who we hey. had on the podcast just a couple of days ago. Awesome. A couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago. Yeah. So um, Damon's working with us, uh, but they're in South Australia. So we have to kind of account for that in our pitch to um, Screen West. Um, so they want at least 80% of the funds that they give you to be spent in state. So that benefits the state, mm. right? Yeah. So so a, a, a movie like I Am Mother will have spent most of that money here in WA, either, you know, doing a couple of shoots here in WA or hiring people from WA, like to, to increase Western Australia's uh, renown internationally, essentially. Mm. Um, so in this case, like game developers have a very, very, uh, good reputation as far as indies go um, for making a very small amount of cash go a very long way. Um, a good example of that here in WA is Black Lab, um, who met, went and made um, a whole bunch of little 
Uh, I shouldn't say little. A whole bunch of very impressive uh, space strategy games, and now they're working on the Battlestar Galactica IP. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Star Hammer, the Vanguard Prophecy was one of the other big ones, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, they got that uh, recognition. There wasn't a Screen West Games Fund for them, but they had the Australian Games Fund while it um, was active. Rest in peace. And so that allowed them to create a business and to hire people. And then once they were established, they got that IP and now they're just running on their own money. So it allowed them to, to get some foundations. And because of how unstable the industry has been since the global financial crisis, we really need that to actually get studios up and running, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it's awesome. Like, and uh, uh, as... um. As it's sort of been mentioned a couple of times, this is a first round of funding. So, you know, there's definitely potential yeah. for this to get bigger and better in the future as well. So fingers crossed, mm. fingers crossed that this happens again and there's more money involved and um, more people get funded. Hells yeah. Cool. Well, speaking of something that's not going to get funded, um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a leak that surfaced today um, that I thought was pretty interesting. I want to have a quick chat about. And it was from a, from a 4chan post. It turns out that there was a cancelled Batman game that was going to be a sequel to Arkham Knight that was being w- worked on by Warner Brothers Montreal. So it, w- it wasn't Rocksteady, but Montreal who did the Batman Arkham Origins. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some accompanying concept art with, that comes with it. And it was gonna the game was actually going to star Damian Wayne, um, which I believe is, is Bruce and Talia al Ghul's son. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's going to star Damian Wayne and it was going to be um, you know, a bit further forward in the timeline. And there, are, it, it, the concept art's really cool. Um, if anyone's interested, just look it up online. If you search for uh, concept art from Cancel Damian Wayne game, it should come up. Oh, um, is this the rumours that were going around just prior to E3 this year about the Court of Owls game? No. So that I was going to get to that because that's that's a separate matter. So it, what it sounds like happened is this game was cancelled first mm. and then... Oh, either they were being worked on simultaneously or this game turned into the Court of Owls game. Right. Because the Court of Owls game has been kind of hinted at as recent as like mid, as like, yeah, E3. There's been like some T-shirts and some some developers who are wearing some owl masks. And there's been a few hints here and there yeah. that there is a, a, a Court of Owls based game coming out. There's some but that I- yeah, ma- Massive, I was just going to say there's some massive potential with that storyline because it's one of the perhaps best known- Batman storylines yet I think on the screen it's only really been adapted for the Gotham TV show um, from what I understand mm, okay. um, and honestly I don't think they did that great a job of it um, Gotham's a weird show but e- even that storyline I think they probably left a lot on the cutting room floor from what it could have been but um, yeah, I, yeah. Th- there's definitely a good opportunity to adapt that for a game for sure it, mm. yeah it, it seems like Warner Bros Montreal has, has kind of been bouncing between a few different projects because there was also um, Jason Schreier from Kotaku put out a, 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 an article about a cancelled Suicide Squad game that mm-hmm. they were also working on. Um, that was cancelled a while ago now. But so at, at one point or another, they've been working on a cancelled Suicide Squad game, a cancelled um, Damian Wayne game, and probably a a in in development Court of Owls game. But that hasn't actually been announced yet. Um, but yeah, do do check out the the concept art because there's cool stuff like it. There's a, a female version of Black Mask in there. There's Gorilla Grodd. Um, Grodd's cool. Yeah, yeah, and there's yeah a, a different Penguin and old Bruce Wayne mm-hmm. um, as like a retired Batman. And apparently, it was going to have like a Nemesis system kind of, kind of similar to the Middle Earth games as well. Ooh, mm-hmm. That'd and, be really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you guys are you guys ready for another Batman game? I, before uh, this week, I would have told you maybe no, but I've actually just gone and watched the Titans TV series on uh, Netflix this week. You know, the um, the live action version of like mm. the Teen Titans kind of uh, superhero mashup. And I've got to yeah. say, that series was surprisingly really good. I was expecting it to be okay. absolute hot trash, but it was awesome. And there's enough Batman related stuff in it that got me kind of excited about uh, the Batverse again. Um so yeah, I, I could definitely do one for sure. I think there's been enough time. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be the uh, killer here and just be like, so <laughs> Batman doesn't look. kill people, <laughs> <laughs> but I do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um. No. So so, not that I wouldn't dislike it, but more to the point that there are other superheroes available. 
You know, and and these games weren't that long ago. Have you checked right? their schedules, Matt? Do you actually know that for sure? <laughs> <laughs> More to the point, right? Like, what was the gap we had between the most recent Spider-Man we game we got and the last one? Right? Mm, like, there was a substantial been, uh, probably amazing, gap. Probably Amazing Spider-Man 2 to Marvel Spider-Man. Probably like five yeah. years. We, we know that it won't be the same gap between this and the next one, though. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just, I just- there's tons of potential there, but I don't know. I would like to see something different. I think there's other really interesting superheroes. It, it, I would be equally as annoyed, like, if we had just gotten Superman games over and over again since that really bad one on Nintendo 64. Yeah. <laughs> like, that we- it's just something different, you know? Um, unless they- unless they took what they did with Batman and made it better in the way that Spider-Man took what they did with previous Spider-Man games and made it better. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they can do that because they were already freaking great games. So yeah. it's it funny just you feels like it'd be downhill from here, right? You you mentioned Superman. That was actually another part of the of the the leak. The person who posted it said that um, Warner Brothers Montreal did pitch a Superman game, to, but it never got greenlit. So <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. I could I have actually had this discussion with students just recently about how the problem with like a Superman or Iron Man game is they're basically a flight sim. Um, mm. And the audience for that is limited, so that's why they don't make them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, but the 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 last part of the leak was that Rocksteady are apparently working on a quote superhero creation game. So, and there's a I'm not sure if it was part of the same leak or just people speculating that it it's likely going to be like a games as a service type thing, like you know cr- create a superhero and be in a shared shared world. And I think I think I'm way more down for that than I am for another Arkham game, personally. Absolutely, mm-hmm. that sounds really cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People will come up with some pretty creative stuff, and I mean, there's there's a huge open book on what kind of abilities they could add to a game like that. But yeah, I mean, w- do you think a game like that would actually have to come with some sort of balance in terms of the powers? Because in a lot of these superhero settings like the x-men are probably one of the best examples like there is a huge amount of imbalance between different heroes powers and that's part of what makes for a compelling story it doesn't sort of follow the same rules that you have to with game design per se because it's not what they're that intent on so i would speculate that if it is a a gecko games as a service type model it would probably be fairly constrained like a way a lot of other superhero creation games handle it is by using like archetypes Mm. so you'll you'll choose like a, a a physical superhero or a magic superhero or like a, a summoning superhero something like that and then and then within those different archetypes you can tailor it in certain ways so so you have like, like a, a sorcerer class and like things like your doctor strange and your scarlet witch would be that archetype and then you could have like yeah, a speedster yeah. type and then you'd have a whole bunch of things that would fit into that mold sort of thing. yes exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so it'd probably See, be something like that mm. I, th- there's a dream game I've always wanted to make where it's an RPG style thing. And at the very start, you choose the game's difficulty by selecting how many things your character can do. Mm. And that seems like it'd work really, really well for a superhero game. Because if you go and make a character that's Superman, that's probably going to be a really easy playthrough. Whereas if you go and make Batman, that's going to be a bit tougher. And the difficulty should kind of um, represent that, right? But that doesn't work for games as a service. Like, that would be a terrible idea. And yeah, that wouldn't work at all. It'd be a single player game. I'd like to see a game like that actually properly experiment when you're coming to, like, character creation with, like, a proper flaws system. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I'd like like to see it where the enemies scale in their like intensity to match how op your superhero is Mm. so if you create a superhero who is somewhat limited maybe like a batman or a nightwing type then the enemies are going to be like thugs and and criminals but if you create superman you're going to be fighting like zod and aliens and that sort of thing so you can you can have all the all the op powers but then your your enemies are going to have op powers too so yeah yeah and if you- all your enemies are always equipped with kryptonite. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly, yeah. And if you party up with uh, a Superman, then sucks to be you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. All right, well, uh, I guess we can move into our, our main topic for tonight. So um, this one is uh, something we haven't chatted about for a little while, but it's it's a timely thing to circle back around to, given what's about to happen in the next check time. 
probably 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, uh, No Man's Sky Beyond is launching uh, as of right now. Um, you know, the, the launch is happening simultaneously across different platforms. I don't know if it's hit Steam yet, but by the time you listen to this, it will absolutely be out. Um, but one of the biggest things that's happening with um, No Man's Sky Beyond, of course, is the, the VR element. So virtual reality has come to No Man's Sky for the first time ever. Um, It's not one of the features that was initially sort of uh, talked about um, when the game uh, was initially getting teased. It was kind of not on the cards for for all of the features that No Man's Sky was initially going to have. I mean, granted, um, the game, you know, through its launch controversy was missing a few of the things that, you know, were sort of the expectation set initially. But VR was never part of that picture. So this is very much a case of, uh, you know, further on down the track, they've realized that this is something that they can do and they can add to the game. But the end result is going to be, from from all um, sort of reports early on, that this is going to be the largest sandbox um, that uh, VR has been attached to out in the market to date. Like, I, I don't think there's any other game besides perhaps Minecraft, if you want to make the argument for that, because you can play Minecraft in VR, um, that is going to be quite as, as open a sandbox as uh, No Man's Sky when it comes to actually playing the game in a virtual environment. So that that's a bit of a milestone. And um, the fact that this milestone is happening now when we're into uh, effectively the third um, sort of year coming up on the fourth year cycle of uh, consumer VR units being available. We haven't really talked about how VR has been going for a while, so I um, thought it'd be a good chance tonight to, to sort of chat about our updated feelings on it and uh, and where we think it's actually pushing in the games industry. So, um, follow, I mean, following that opener, Matt, I know that you're keen to jump in for some No Man's Sky. Are you, are you sort of most attracted by the VR element or is it a lot of the other stuff in particular? I, what? I don't actually have a PSVR headset yet. Yeah. And quite honestly, like... The place where virtual reality is, and especially around the the PlayStation 4 and the PSVR, it actually has me interested. And with every game release that comes out that I'm looking at, and it's like, oh, man, that looks really cool. Like, I get closer and closer to actually going out and investing in a headset, right? Yeah. Um, and No Man's Sky is absolutely one of those things that is kind of tipping me towards that uh, point that I will purchase it. And I think- like that's kind of a that's kind of a relevant point, right? Like I'm I certainly I wouldn't call myself a hardcore gamer, um, not in comparison to how some other people are. Not the, not the people that were there on the first wave of VR, right? But if I'm starting to get that, to that point where I would actually be willing to purchase it, then there's going to be a tipping point where your average you know uh, person on the street will be willing to pay for the VR experience, right? Yeah. Um. So I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, and I actually, I actually did a bit of research for this because I've, I've developed a VR game. So certainly at the point at which we had developed that stuff, it was absolutely not worth it. Um, but everything that I'm seeing from figures now, like there's apparently 8.9 million headsets out there at the moment. Of just um, PlayStation? No, of every single headset type. Okay, so that's cool. the key thing here, right? So that's that's total. Now, there's 100 million PS4s. Mm. 100 million. You know, like if you release a game on the PS4, if you manage to secure 1% of that market, that's really freaking good. You know, whereas right now, if you release a thing on PSVR, then you're talking about a percent of that 8.9 million and then a percent on top of that that you actually manage to secure in sales, Mm. right? Mm. And so it's still at that point where I think for developers- where unless you have the financial aid, you're it's probably still not quite at a point where an indie is going to make VR games and make money off of it without doing a non-VR version. Um, so until we reach that tipping point where the average Joe, Joe on the street, um, an average Jane on the street is actually going out there and purchasing headsets, um, it's only not worth it for us to make games for it yet. It's it's funny you mentioned indie developers there, Matt. And one thing I've encountered with VR is I think that a lot of people who are even like VR enthusiasts or, or casual VR enthusiasts, they've kind of been put off by the proliferation of like short or like small VR games where it doesn't feel like there's that many substantial things to seek your teeth into. And as an indie, I'm guessing that those are more the kind of games that you'd you know be t- be looking at developing given your your budgetary constraints and everything like that so it's i almost feel like it's outside of the hands of the indie developers to to be the ones pushing this and, yes. and it really it needs to be these these bigger 
uh, yep. studio. No, I mean, No Man's um, Hello Games, they are an indie studio, but it needs to, it needs to be a, they've got funding from Sony and it, and it needs to be a bigger, bigger game than, than, yeah. a, than a small experience. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, indies are great at experimental experiences, but people buying VR headsets aren't interested in experimental experiences yet. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're sure. interested in action games and and those kinds of things. Like, I think a really good example is um, Falcon Age. Mm. If you've heard of Falcon Age, like it's this really cute game where you ha- uh, take care of a falcon and raise it and you you train it, um, and it looks amazing. Like it's one of the games that would actually sell me on a VR headset, but I don't know if it's sold very well because it's not the kind of game that typically moves VR headsets. That'd be no. something more like Beat Saber or Blood and Truth, right? Like. Those games shift headsets. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's actually quite funny. Just this afternoon, um, my my brother messaged me uh, saying that he is ex- really excited to play No Man's Sky in VR tonight, and he's going to do an all nighter and 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 play it because he's so keen. And he's a gamer that mostly he plays um, like shooters. Like he plays Call of Duty. He does play Destiny. Um, he's a, a console gamer sort of exclusively. And it's really unusual to to have a game that he's this excited about, um, and for it to be a VR game, I think that's that says a lot. Like he doesn't really message me much about gaming at all, but he's messaging me about how keen he is for No Man's Sky VR. So doesn't he know who you are? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I replied to it being like, "Hey, actually, you know, I, I talk about this sort of stuff on my podcast." Um, but yeah, maybe he'll listen to this one. Who knows? Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, it, it's funny. I like, I mean, th- this is obviously only speaking about a, a small um, sample size of people that uh, you know I know directly and um, that you guys sort of know as well. Um, but most of our sort of immediate group of gamer friends, I think, over the last year or so. I would say that about half of them now own VR sets, and a, a large catalyst for that was recent price drops of the PlayStation VR over sale periods last year. Um, and Beat Saber is probably another yeah, big one Beat as well. Saber. Yeah, Beat Saber yeah. was a huge point of change for that, where you know people started sort of getting involved in playing that game. I mean, they're not playing it live together, but there's that sort of um, sense of uh, you know friendly competition that exists when you're comparing your scores with your friends, and that definitely has been a catalyst for some of that activity. So yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently, in the past year, twenty seven percent is the growth of the VR headset market. Wow! Like it's it. The year before that, it had actually declined somewhat. Yeah. yeah. Um. Whereas this past year, it's had a massive spike, and it will be because of games like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how volatile that that is. That it can yeah. rest on it can rest on just a couple of games to to swing it so like backwards or forwards. Mm. Yeah. But it is also I think like if they keep up that sort of momentum, like. The the uh, big document that I was reading basically is predicting that by like 2023, there's going to be something like 60 million VR headsets out in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're currently at 8.9, right? Um, and so it almost seems like that sort of momentum is just going to keep going as long as games like Beat Saber and No Man's Sky and all those others keep on getting made, you know, that encourage it's, people to buy those headsets. Isn't there, isn't there like a, a generational issue there though, where as technology progresses, like these current 8 million will be obsolete in maybe five years and yeah. then they, they can't really be counted again. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think that's going to be the key thing is, is like, is that, you know, 60 million odd headsets, all brand new headsets, uh, or yeah. is it just headsets floating in the market, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But because they're peripherals, I mean, for the most part, they're going to be tied to the systems that they're um, linked to. So like PlayStation VR, for, for instance, is not going to in itself become obsolete in the same way that a PS4 will. Um, you know, I, I don't know what Sony's plans are with the PS5 or whatever that ends up being called. I'm going to call it now, though. It's going to be a PS5. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the, the PS4 VR um, headset will probably work with that. I, I think they'd be mad not to have some sort of compatibility considerations for, for that peripheral. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people who have that set are going to be able to port it over. And, you know, that's probably even going to be a gateway for them to get into the next generation of the system um, as well. So there's there's not enough market attachment for them to not support the current PSVR. Definitely. Like yeah, if yeah. they if they did a new one, they'd be starting over. Like it would be back to zero and people wouldn't be encouraged to buy it because like, well shit, how long's this new headset going to last before it's outdated? Yeah. Yeah. I I have this crazy delusion that I know is is 
likely never going to happen. And it's the when I think about VR, sometimes it, it occurs to me that it's it's their HMDs, right? They're head-mounted displays, and when it comes to a, a non-head-mounted display, a conventional display, they are like um, produced by third parties, and they work with all consoles. And and you know, like your your Panasonic TV or your LG TV, you don't have to buy this like a Sony TV to use a PlayStation, but you have to buy a PSVR headset to use PSVR. Mm. And I'd love there to be a future where. VR is agnostic to the platform that you're using, even on consoles, and that you just buy like the latest Samsung headset and then it works on everything. Totally. Like, because it, it is just a display. Mm. I feel like there was actually rumors um, way back that Oculus was going to work on Xbox, or does that, is that actually still the case? It might actually be a thing. Well, we don't I'm know sure. what the next generation is going to offer in terms of compatibility with that sort of hardware. So I, yeah. I feel like that was a discussion back when we were doing Symphony a couple of years ago that, um, because, yeah, because, uh, yeah, no, it's weird. But I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't know if that will actually happen because, like, as, as we've seen, like, exclusivity makes money, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Sony in particular have proven that they're pretty much a walled garden when it comes to sort of curating the PlayStation experience TM. <laughs> you know, yeah, because yeah. everyone wants to have the better experience. And if you're sharing your, like, resources, if it's, if it's yeah. then you're not, you can't really claim yours is better than your competitor. And it's not, that's not good business. So, yeah. It's certainly also uh, the case for like um, game developers and for and for the platform holders, right? Like having your own hardware means that everything that gets made for it is made for that specific product, and it's it's little weird uh, uh, bits and pieces that you need to account for. Mm-hmm. Whereas yeah. if you're making something that supports every single VR headset, that's a massive undertaking. Yeah. Um. So this for wouldn't sure. work unless there was one headset that every single platform used, and that's never going to happen. And we don't really have a, a universally adapted control scheme between systems yet either. Like, they've all got some variations yeah. in them. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely some consistency, um, but- and, and, you know, certain games are definitely built built to have different control schemes depending on which platform they're played on for the ones that are across different platforms. But I think there's still enough of a difference where it's not just a, you know, a literal sort of uh, lift and shift across to a different platform and expecting everything to work exactly the same way. So, yeah. 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 There was actually um, one more little statistic that I found that was actually super interesting. Um, and certainly as a game developer, again, like this just adds to my reasons to not make a VR game. Mm. Uh, VR headset owners only spend six hours a month playing in the headset. Okay. Um, and that's on average. So if that's six hours over the course of a month, they're probably only playing one game a month. Um. And so the 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 market attachment for VR headsets, I would imagine, is actually fairly low. Mm. So you're not going to have uh, VR headset owners going out there and buying a shit ton of games. They're going to buy just one or two every month because of the fact that they're only spending that many hours, right? Like the investment is it would be massive to up to that amount of time. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So that, that sort of indicates that for games hobbyists, like the VR experience is very much a supplemental activity as opposed to the core yes. activity. Yeah. And that's totally understandable because it's not quite there yet where it's comfortable enough, I reckon. Mm, yeah. Mm. Just like a- anecdotally for me, like I-, I am really keen on VR. I got a an Oculus like development kit one way back um, and I got have my PSVR now. But in the last year, the only game I've played is Beat Saber. That's, that's, that's been it. Like I- yeah. And- uh, even for No Man's Sky, I actually I almost feel like it deserves a PC headset, like a Vive or an, mm. or an, or an Oculus. So I'm, I'm hesitant to actually pick it up on PlayStation because I want to wait and play it on a higher fidelity headset. Mm. Well, you'll yeah. get some feedback from us on how that is in the next few yeah. days. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. I think um, it, it's... <sighs> For, for the small amount of time that you're going to put into the experience, you do want it to be the best one you can possibly get for that for that time investment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But- it, um, it, it, mm. It's very much kind of like the Wild West at the moment. And it reminds me a lot of how things were around the time that Nintendo came out with the Nintendo 64, mm, right? Mm. And everybody was just writing their own rules for how 3D games should work. Um, and that didn't really get, like- the, the, until the rules got established, people weren't entirely sold on that stuff yet. Mm. Um, and you didn't see anybody ripping off like Super Mario 64 and the way that it did just, it just mastered platform controls in the, in 3D, right? Like nobody was, was ripping off that 
right away. It took a while before people were getting it right in the same way that Super Mario was. And I think that we're going to kind of get to the point with a lot of these uh, first person games and action games and everything about like, how do you do certain mechanics, right? Like I was watching um, one of my friends play Blood and Truth. And there's a couple of moments in that where like you have to grab on to terrain and pull yourself up onto a ledge. Mm. And it was hit and miss. Like the mechanic just didn't work particularly well. Um, but there'll come a point where somebody writes the rules on how to get that right. And then everybody will be doing that thing and it will be creating, it'll be easy to create games that do that mechanic. And there'll be more games out there for people to buy. We'll encourage more people to get into the the space. So, yeah. Yeah, totally agree. So I guess in terms of the tech evolving in recent years, the, the big thing that seems to be coming to the forefront now is, uh, you know, the first wave of wireless solutions when it comes to VR. Um, so the uh, the Oculus Quest has is, is been making some big waves recently with regards to that being, you know, an extremely um, high fidelity and, and quality approach to, to wireless um, VR and not relying on another console or a computer to actually, um, you know, run the games. It's all sort of built into the, the one package. Um, and that seems to be picking up a bit of momentum because it's, you know, priced at a pretty reasonable point as well and, you know, plays some of the very popular VR games extremely successfully. So, you know, apparently it's an absolute dream with Beat Saber. So that's gotten a lot of people interested in that thing because I tell you what, I would love to play Beat Saber without cords dangling behind me. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, but yeah, like the, the Oculus Quest is ultimately limited by the power of the hardware that's built into it, though, right? Yeah. Because it's not you can't hook it up to a beefy PC system, unless I'm mistaken. Well, the biggest downside um, is is going to be the um, the playtime as well, because the battery life means yeah. that you're going to have to recharge between sessions. I think it holds yeah. a charge for about two to three hours. Um, yeah. And if you forget to charge between sessions, or if you want to play for longer, then you're probably going to be shit out of luck. So yeah, the- there, there is the there's the HTC Vive Pro wireless module that you can get as well yeah is that the, um, the at, vive s or something yeah yeah is that the vive s yeah but I, I remember looking at it recently and it's crazy expensive because you have to get the it's the it's an additional couple of hundred at least on top of the vive pro which is already like over a thousand or around a thousand so it, it, like high fidelity wireless vr is still like prohibitively expensive I think. Yeah. No, yeah, the um, Oculus uh, uh, Rift S is the one I was getting confused with. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah Cause like, no matter what, like, if you want to get the Oculus, you have to account for the price of the headset in addition to the price of a PC that can make use of the headset. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And that, for most families, is going to be way out of their price range. And so, until we get to a point where those two investments aren't so massive and the headset is much less expensive i don't think we're going to see like a major pickup um in the general public not not to mention like um the wireless technology is certainly good right now but it can be so much better when it comes to stuff like latency and lag um that you know as we improve that stuff it's just going to get cheaper and it's going to be a kind of better experience as well so it's probably not the right time right now for you know just just a normal family to go picking it up yeah the um the Vive that uh, sorry the um the Valve one um that uh, I was thinking of before was the Valve Index, so that's the one that um you might have seen that it, it is um sort of shipping with the new uh, knuckle style controllers, so they're oh, yeah. the pressure sensitive ones that um track all five fingers movement, so that makes them a little bit like gloves but not quite the same. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, just pretty cool. So yeah, I'm. I, I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt that um, the, the popularity train was going to continue to chug along pretty solidly for yeah. PSVR for a while longer. It seems to, you know, be the, the, the easiest entry point for most people just due to the library of games that are available on the platform and the fact that the console is so accessible for a lot of people to get onto. So, yeah. yeah. You don't have to think about building a PC. Mm. You just buy the no. console. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. But broadly speaking, I think that like some people may think I'm naive perhaps, but the concept of virtual reality as an entity is just far too enticing for it to ever truly go away. I think like now yeah. we've reached, now we've reached this point. It's not like 3D TV. Think, yeah. Yeah. It's not like 3D TV. No. Like I think as a, as a, as a species almost, we're not going to abandon the concept of virtual reality because it is, it is so enticing. And I think that 
it, it may just take longer than we like, but it will it will incrementally keep getting better and more, more affordable for sure. Well, there's been media well, supporting like the dream of proper virtual reality for a long time now. We've seen movies yeah, about yeah. it since the original Lawnmower Man and Tron, like freaking forever ago, you know. It's like electric cars or something like that, like mm. clean energy, where where it'll 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 be a matter of time. At the moment, it's enthusiasts and and that sort of thing, but it'll it'll trickle down eventually. Yeah, there's also like on the industry side, right? Like three D TVs, they never picked up because for government organizations, what's the use, right? Whereas with VR, like there's medical uses, there's there's military uses, there's so many uses outside of just entertainment. That will keep pushing the tech forward yeah. in much the same way that the internet was pushed forward by by those interests, you know. Um, so so I to- totally agree. VR is not going to go anywhere because while it's going to be useful for those industries outside of entertainment, those are just going to keep on feeding back into entertainment and making the entertainment side better. Yeah. And porn. Don't forget porn. Yeah. And porn. <laughs> the most the most best entertainment. <laughs> it's funny you should mention that actually I pulled out a, uh, a diagram for our, um, our big group chat earlier today in, in which um, demonstrated the uh, the highest traffic websites globally at the moment like it was a top 100 list and out of that top 100 list in the top 10 two of the sites were porn sites so yeah that is absolutely still out there as <laughs> one of the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the biggest use cases for sure so yeah but um, like I, I guess we, we we all kind of agree that VR hasn't sort of been the runaway success that you know maybe some people hoped or thought it would be in the opening um sort of year or two. But it's you know slowly but surely picking up momentum and not going anywhere. But like in terms of games that that we feel are driving our own personal interest, is there anything that you you would be really excited to play that you haven't gotten to play yet? Like if you if you had to maybe name a few of your your top VR game interests that aren't ones that you've played already, what what would you be thinking of title wise? So for me, like uh, Falcon Age is definitely one of them because I mm-hmm. just think it looks adorable as heck. Um, but probably the big one is actually Blood and Truth because it looks like, hey, look, you're the main character in an action movie. And that's just so cool. Like that, that is such a cool fantasy to be able to like be rolling around on my bedroom floor dodging bullets. Yeah. Like that just sounds amazingly fun. Um, like for me, like I've, I've made it clear in past, like Beat Saber just doesn't appeal to me as much. I love the idea of it, but I wouldn't play it because I'm just garbage with rhythm games. Mm. Um, but, but Blood and Truth in particular, like, I just love the idea of that. There's also a whole bunch of really neat experimental puzzle games in VR that, um, have just never really taken off, but they, they look super interesting. Yeah. What are you about you, Christian? What do you think? I'm actually a big advocate of like third person or like disembodied perspective VR games where you're like like a god floating above a a, a world um like the Astrobot Astrobot VR if you know that yeah Astrobot Rescue um, Mission yeah. yeah yeah so I would love to see like a, a strategy game or something like a total war game where you're like floating above the the battlefield and can like fly around and and position your units and that sort of thing mm. um so I, I that would be really really enticing to me would be more disembodied like strategy or or like um yeah games like that so so matt how quickly would you run out and buy a vr set if there was uh stellaris and vr <laughs> stellaris and vr would suck <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably a bit too much going on for that one no that would be awful i i would hate um actually trying to do that there was there was a game that i was making with friends quite a while ago that uh, we were super excited about which was basically um you remember black and white Mm, um, yes, we were that's, making yeah. we were making black and white in VR. Ah, awesome! That, that's exactly the kind of thing I was I was thinking about. Is yeah. that's that style of game? Yeah, yeah. We th- never they, we they never got that far be, with it. They can also be pretty good with producing like motion sickness too, because your the 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 like the plane that you're looking at on the up underneath you is like fairly static. So that's like a fixed point of reference, and you're you're kind of just flying above it. I think that it can be pretty pretty good for motion sickness as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I think I think for me, like RPGs and such, like that'd be awesome in VR, like being able to actually play a role. And then like, you know, I, I think that we've kind of gotten there a little bit with like Skyrim and Fallout, but those are just older games ported to VR. I want to see a VR role playing game that's just VR, you know? Mm. Detroit would have been cool in VR. Oh, yeah. That'd have been really neat. Yeah. It'd be quite interesting. 
Maybe, probably graphically wouldn't be anywhere near as, as good, but... Uh, God, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> style of game, absolutely. And- Honestly, No Man's Sky as well. Like when I think about the kind of games that I would have dreamed dreamed of getting in VR, No Man's Sky is that kind of game as well. Mm. Like a, a massive explorable universe where you can fly around in spaceships and and go into caves and find weird aliens and go underwater. That is like almost the pinnacle of of coolness for VR. Yeah. Um. And the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm surprised that. I'm not getting it. Yet, and <laughs> yeah, I haven't decided yeah. to get it, and I think it really is being a stickler for the wanting to get it, like because it's so exciting to me. I, I do want it to be the best experience possible. So yeah. I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm, I'm debating internally as as I speak. The the See, aspect of No Man's Sky that I'm most looking forward to with that in mind is going to be the um, spaceship um, sort of uh, traversal. So the actual yeah. sort of you know spaceship dogfighting and combat, I think, is going to be absolutely amazing. So I'm. I'm sitting here thinking about all these different game genres that I want to see in VR. Mm. And like, we've done a lot of horror, but oh my God, do I want to see a stealth game? Like a oh. first person stealth game in VR? And how intense would that be? Oh, dude, like, Hitman in VR. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, so <laughs> here's a here's a random aside. Like the other day, my students were following me down the hallway and <laughs> I knew they were following me down Not the hallway. Creepy. I know. They, it, they, they, they were convinced that I have some weird- doppelganger um that has been going into some car park that i've i don't go into so now i'm freaked out but they were stalking me down this hallway and talking about it they were like a fair distance away so they thought they must have you know they couldn't i couldn't hear them and so i zipped around the corner and they walked past and it was the most satisfying feeling just like oh, there they go okay now time to go out and start stalking them <laughs> irl style scan super teacher like behavior yeah absolutely yep <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you, you can almost build it around uh, that concept of like um, kids doing like a Nancy Drew style, your Hardy yeah. Boys kind of uh, adventure sleuthing game and uh, have those stealth elements. That'd oh, be cool. Yeah. Like <sighs> CSI is one of those things where their games were really shit, but imagine if they did that well in VR. Mm. Like a game where you had to pay attention to your surroundings and find evidence and be like a- th- th- There's so many cool concepts they could do in VR. It just makes it kind of unfortunate- we're still stuck in this, like, everything has to be an action game phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, the other good thing with the the approach that they've taken with um, things like No Man's Sky 2 is that game is built so that you can pop the headset off at any time and go back to the default way to play the game. So, you know, if a game is not going to be built directly for that um, environment of of playing in VR and, and kind of only being able to experience in that environment, make it variable. Like, because if one of the barriers to entry is people only wanting to spend a, a certain number of hours per day playing in VR and they don't want to play for longer than that. Like even Jam, talking to Jam about the way she's going to approach the No Man's Sky updates, like she's not keen to play it in VR all the time, but she definitely wants to be able to do it like when she feels um, the urge to. Um, yeah. Being able to switch between the two, I think, is a really big plus for that experience and we'll probably get more people trying it than, you know, if it was otherwise the case, for sure. So... Yeah, VR's cool. VR's still cool. Looking forward to seeing what else comes out. I, I don't know if there's any other huge releases that we're kind of looking forward to this year that are on the horizon, though. Like, I'm I'm not aware of any in the periphery that uh, are kind of, I, I guess, notable titles that are getting any sort of marketing at this point. Do you, do you know of any, Christian? Is there anything that you've got your eye on, or is it? Yeah. Not Nothing springs to mind, actually. No, like, I can't think of anything, so, really. No Man's Sky may, in fact, be the big one this year, then. If uh, yeah. that's kind of the continuing trend. I mean, la- last year we did sort of have a bunch that came out around the same time, which were getting quite a bit of attention, but a lot of it was after the fact too. Like Astrobot in particular was very popular for a while, but that was one that I think was kind of discovered by accident and then picked up momentum after it released. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What I know of um, VR games on Steam, they don't sell very well at all. Yeah. Um, But- I think that if we're looking at a drought of PS4 VR games, I would wager that's because people are working on stuff for PS5. Yeah, that's probably entirely true too. Cool. Well, well, anyway, let's wrap it there because uh, I want to go and play and actually experience this for myself. (laughs) (laughs) Selfishly, perhaps. But yeah. Um, But anyway, that is a show. So uh, thank you, gentlemen. And um, Matt, if people want to sort of get in touch with us and give us their thoughts on VR, where's the best way to do it? Uh, So you can catch us by email at mail at partyloaded.com. Uh, look us up on Facebook at Party Loaded. Uh, our Twitter is at Party Loaded Show. And we're on YouTube and Twitch as well. If you just look up Channel End Game or Party Loaded. That's it. You won't see us streaming on Twitch with VR, though, because I think that's, you know, what are you going to look at? That's like an awful idea. Jesus. Yeah. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. All right. Well, anyway, I think uh, I think we've talked about what we're going to be doing over the next week enough already, but. Uh, We'll circle back around and, and no doubt have a bit more thoughts on that um, in seven days' time. Adrian will be back as well, of course, um, pending any uh, doppelganger-related accidents in the meantime. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But anyway, thank you, everybody, for listening. Hope you've enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week. Uh, until then, good night. Good night. Good night. The Party Loaded Podcast is a Channel Endgame production. For this and more great gaming content, bookmark channelendgame.com.